Welcome back. As the Fed kicks off a two-day meeting, the markets have been looking through the leaves to see if the Fed is right, that inflation is transitory. We've got annualized PPI hitting a more than 10-year high, with the rise in energy prices also contributing to rising costs for corporations. But lumber and copper prices have been falling from their lofty highs earlier this year. Well, despite copper's pullback, Kepler says there's a good chance of copper heading for a super cycle, but not energy due to the excess capacity. Reed Ianson is a senior commodity analyst at Kepler. He joins us now from Houston, Texas. Reed, good to have you with us. Uh, you know, we had a surge in commodity prices surging in 2021. All the speculation that we're entering into a commodity super cycle, are you seeing that happen? I think it depends on the commodity you're looking at. There are certain delineations between, say, copper, iron ore, and crude oil. Certainly, copper, I think, has a good future ahead of it, especially towards mid-decade, given the fact that even if you see weakness in Chinese demand, we're going to see probably improvements in demand uh, within the Western, larger Western developed economies as they push through large infrastructure spending. This is not so true for uh, iron ore and oil at this point, given the fact that especially with iron ore markets, there is uh, a dependency on Chinese demand that will remain um, far more than is true in, say, copper markets right now. Okay, if you take away uh, oil, if you take away iron ore, will commodities still be the best investment for 2021? Again, I think it really depends. Oil, it's, uh, I, I think, looks good this year as long as OPEC Plus sticks to its production cut agreements. I continue to, to, to push this point. If, if we see any um, uh, supply demand imbalance to the supply side over shooting demand, uh, we could certainly see prices pull back from current levels. But at this point, I'm pretty bullish on, on oil prices through the end of this year. Uh, iron ore, I think, also looked pretty good through the end of this year. But longer term, I would say those two commodities um, have have a, a more uncertain future in terms of upward price movement. But again, we go back to copper. I think copper looks good um, over the next several years, just given the applications into renewables investments uh, that are going to happen across um, the developed and developing world. Reid, the last time that we had a super cycle, it was uh, partly driven by the fact that you had a mammoth economy like China industrializing and a number of other, other emerging markets as well that were industrializing. This time, of course, China has done a lot of industrializing already. Is the problem that we could see some kind of growth peaking out as we speak in China when it comes to the future outlook for commodities? Yeah, absolutely. And this is where the delineation is very key. Iron ore, uh, iron ore markets are very dependent on Chinese purchases. China purchases nearly 70% of all seaborne iron ore volumes. If you see any slowdown in China, you will see weakness in that market. I also think that iron ore doesn't have as much of an application into, um, say, renewables investment moving forward. And that is where you're going to see a lot of spending in non-Chinese Western markets. Now, uh, of course, you look to, to a market like copper and and even if you see weakness in the Chinese market, which is possible over the next few years, uh, I think that uh, the, the metal will do quite well, given the fact that you're going to have a lot of westernized economies, if I, as I've mentioned, willing to spend a lot of money um, to, to, uh, to, to make sure that they are, quote unquote, greening their economy. And that's going to require a lot of copper input moving in uh, uh, copper moving forward. Also, just a key point here, iron market, iron ore markets have shown an ability to really uh, uh, answer to higher demand over the last decade. Copper markets have struggled a lot more to respond to higher demand. That is, um, bringing on mines within the copper market have been much uh, much more of a slow process compared to, say, what we've seen in, in iron ore markets with especially Australian producers readily willing to step in and meet higher demand when it, when it, uh, when it happens on a yearly basis. You, you raise an excellent question, and that is uh, the one of capacity, right? Because, you know, while there might be a lot of spare capacity, say, in the oil market, there are certain commodities where there's been years and years and years of underinvestment, and therefore it's not that easy to just quickly ramp up supply. Wh which commodities, Reid, do you see at the worst 
situation of uh, potential supply tightness? No doubt this is uh, copper for sure. Uh, a number of producers in this market have grown extremely conservative over the past decade. Uh, and this has really caused um, underinvestment to, to kind of percolate through the supply chain. And obviously now that's creating problems. You also have long lead time. So a lot of these firms are now realizing that prices are higher and they want to take advantage. But the lead time to get new mines online is, is going to take quite a long time. Also keep in mind that most uh, the, the bulk of, of copper exports come out of Chile. Chile is an, is a region of the world right now that is a bit politically unstable. They're going to have a um, constitutional amendment come into power next, uh, uh, next year, which is creating some political instability. You also have um, some uncertainty around COVID, which is making new investments uh, slower than what was originally expected, say, uh, six to 12 months ago. And so Chile, which is a key... Uh, uh, copper producer um, is is struggling to, to set a timeline for large investments that need to take place to meet the uh, supply shortfall that is already apparent within this market. Now, I, I also want to touch on crude markets. There's a lot of questions around, are we going to have supply shortages there? I would say through mid-decade, we will not. I think OPEC Plus is going to provide plenty of spare capacity, even when assuming pretty strong supply uh, demand growth through mid-decade. I would argue that OPEC plus will still have some 4 million barrels, including Iran, in spare capacity available, say, by 2026. And so I don't see there being supply constraints in, in crude markets. And the same, a similar story is true in, in iron ore markets as well. Um, Australia is planning to bring on quite a bit of additional volume over the next four to five years to make sure they meet uh, the increase in demand globally. Yes. All right, Reed, we'll have to leave it. Thank you so much for your time. Reed Janssen of Kepler. We're getting some.